Thanks, everybody, for coming on this Friday. Thanks, leadership, for canceling votes today. <laughs> My name is Tim Lorden. I'm with the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee and the Executive Director. We put together this panel on, it is technically called, it's part of a three-part series, Legislating Online Safety. Today's event is called Content Ratings on the Web, Legislating a Sexually Explicit Label for Websites. Um, as I mentioned, it's part of a three-part series. We have our event today on web labeling. Next week, on Thursday, September 21, at 2 o'clock in this very same room, we have another slice of this issue, which is should Congress decree social networking and chat sites teen-free zones? Cover some of the issues like the DOPA legislation as well as some major verification proposals for protecting kids on social networking sites. Um, on October 5, which is uh, two weeks after that, we have another issue related to this as part of the series, warehousing consumers online travels to catch child predators and terrorists, privacy impl implications. And that is on October 5 at 2 o'clock. It's in the Mike Mansfield room, which is in the Capitol building on the Senate side. Um, and you're all welcome to that as well. This series uh, looks at a variety of the legislative proposals. And we hope we can kind of at least cover the waterfront of what's on the congressional calendar, or at least on staffers' desks this, this fall before adjournment. Today's event, um, we're very fortunate to have uh, the Office of the Attorney General here. Internet Content Rating Association and the Center for Democracy and Technology represented on the panel were unfortunately Richard Whitten from the National Law Center was in, unable to attend because of a personal family emergency so we're disappointed that he couldn't come and express his views but we'll try to get him on another event maybe within this series. Um, I guess the question is uh, how, how did we, let me also say we, we did kind of a bit of a paper dump. So you have in front of you um, the program itself which is on our red letterhead and that actually includes the panelists' names and how to contact them, as well as um, excerpts from the legislation before us today. Uh, we also passed out a set of one-pager compilations. As we met with our advisory committee, which is a group of 200 private sector organizations, we were struck by how many organizations were doing a tremendous amount in the way of education and development of technology to help parents protect their kids online. So we thought it would be good if we asked them to submit one pages on what they were doing to address this issue in general. Uh, we also got some uh, policy position papers as well. But the vast majority of them are, are statements of different companies, trade associations, and, and organizations that are doing a tremendous amount to keep kids safe online. How did we get here? On April 20th, Attorney General uh, Roberto, uh, Alberto Gonzalez proposed a piece of legislation that would call for websites to uh, label their sites as if they had sexually explicit material. Um, at the time, he said it would prevent people from inadvertently stumbling across pornographic images on the Internet. Um, it, it, subsequent to that, it has appeared in the Internet Safety Act, which was later passed. Ultimately, this provision was stripped out of the Internet Safety Act, um, but it also is in the Senate Communications Package, which is going through the Senate Commerce Committee as we speak and also in the Commerce State Justice Appropriations Bill. So this, this provision we're discussing today is, is in uh, legislation that is moving to a certain extent. Um, the, I think I'll, I'll let uh, uh, the Department of Justice explain a little bit more about the bill. But let me introduce uh, who's actually on the panel. We have Stephen Balcom from the Internet Content Rating Association. Uh, Stephen's been with uh, uh, ICRA for over a decade now, probably 12 years. Um, the organization has a long history, um, but we also have Larry Rothenberg, Senior Counsel and Advisor to the Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy with the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, and finally, Leslie Harris, who's the Executive Director of the Center for Democracy and Technology, has served po pa past stints with People for the American Way Foundation and the ACLU. Now, we're just going to, the format today is a uh, moderated discussion. We're going to have a few opening comments. Um, some moderated questions from me, if that's okay. And then finally, we'll end up with um, audience Q&A. So we'd really like to have an interactive, informal discussion about this issue, um, which is a very serious nature. But if we could enlist some questions from you before we, we close here at about 1, 1.15, um, that would really help the debate. So if I could just go to, go to Larry. Um, from the Department of Justice perspective, why, why is this legislation necessary and how can it help? 
Thanks very much, Tim. First, um, let me apologize on behalf of my boss, uh, Rachel Brand, the Assistant Attorney General for Legal Policy. She couldn't make it uh, at the last minute, uh, and she sent me. Um, I'm sure you were all drawn here by her name on the program instead of mine, um, but I'll try to fill in. Um, first, let me explain exactly what the department is doing. Um, we have what we consider to be a rather modest um, initiative here to protect consumers. It's essentially what it is. This is, this is not censorship. Um, it's not uh, a major uh, uh, break with uh, First Amendment principles or, in fact, with other things that are currently going on to protect consumers, especially children, on the Internet. Um, first of all, we have a uh, proposal to ban sexually explicit material from the first page of any website. And we would analogize that to uh, when you walk into a 7-Eleven, there are blinder racks, uh, what are called blinder racks, over pornographic magazines so that anybody walking in, especially kids, aren't exposed to this uh, in the normal course of uh, walking around uh, a store that sells otherwise legitimate uh, uh, goods. Second of all, uh, we have a requirement that every page of a website that contains sexually explicit material has some kind of code written into its uh, uh, programming that would identify it as sexually explicit for a filter. And again, we consider that not to be censorship. We consider that to be consumer protection. It's going to make it easier for consumers out there if they choose to install a filter on their computer to have that filter pick up this material. And um, let me say that the uh, definition of sexually explicit material is tied to the definition of sexually explicit conduct contained in the Federal Criminal Code, uh, and those are uh, very well uh, explained in the code, um, and we don't think that there's any vagueness to that. Uh, there are many uh, provisions of the Federal Criminal Code that rely on those definitions, and we think that, uh, again, it's not going to be a problem in terms of uh, the First Amendment. That's really what the proposal is. We think it's rather modest. Uh, it's uh, much less intrusive and burdensome than other proposals that have been out there for a number of years uh, that have either been struck down by the Supreme Court or uh, proposed and, and uh, successfully opposed by some of the other people on this panel. Uh, it's modest, but we think it is a first step towards protecting consumers, especially children, as they're out there surfing the net. And, and Stephen, with regard to uh, Mr. Rothenberg's comments, how does, how does this proposal square or not square with, with what your organization is doing with regard to labeling uh, websites? Well, first of all, let me just say that um, we think that this is a very well-intentioned bill and uh, applaud the interest of the administration in it. Unfortunately, we believe that this is probably not the best way to direct government's time and energy and resources uh, to this problem. Um, you mentioned earlier that the years I've been involved in this, back in 2000 I served on the COPA Commission, the Child Online Protection Act Commission, and we looked at the very many different ways six years ago of technologies, tools, and methods for protecting children online, as well as government's attempts to legislate in this area. And we kept coming up against the issues and the problems of the First Amendment. And problems, some people call them a problem, others would call it it's a, one of the underpinnings of this country. And the reason we feel um, that this well-intentioned law is not a good use of resources is that we will live through, again, uh, a rerun of what happened with the CDA and what is still going on with COPA, uh, which is still hung up in the courts. And we feel that where government could best place its time and energy and resources is in public education work, in working with the industry to get behind the existing tools and methods, including the ICRA labeling scheme that's already out there. So while I, I, I understand and I sympathize a great deal with where this is coming from and what it's trying to do, unfortunately I think there will be some unintended consequences uh, to it. Leslie? Well, you know, I, I share the view that the Justice Department is seeking to do what we all want to do, which is to help empower parents to use the tools that exist already in the marketplace to direct their children's online experience. However, this is not a modest proposal. 
It is not even a consumer protection proposal. That is the job of agencies like the Federal Trade Commission. This is a criminal statute with criminal penalties, and it is one that has never been considered by the Judiciary Committees. Uh, it is, uh, has substantial criminal penalties. So the, quest so the question is, um, we all agree that voluntary rating of, conduct, of content is a good thing. We all agree that um, rating of internet content is a good thing. All of these things empower children. The question is, is this a place that government should step in with a very heavy hand of criminal statute? And if you look at the history of trying to do this in this body, it is clear that all you get is you replace the innovation with litigation and you do nothing to protect kids. Uh, mandatory labeling is, uh, you know, is, is a very tricky thing uh, on the internet. And the proposal that the Justice Department uh, has furthered, which is now in legislation, would may be intended to apply to adult sites in the adult industry. I think it's important for you all to understand that the adult industry itself has stepped up in, uh, in partially in um, partnership with ICRA to label their content. So all you are doing is imposing on a vast amount of other internet content that may or may not fall squarely uh, within the legal definition of sexually explicit, an enormous chill. If, uh, if you are an, an, uh, an artist who now sells your material online, you're gonna have to decide whether one piece falls within a sexually explicit label, or perhaps the whole studies. Uh, and, and probably make decisions to remove content from your site rather than to put a label that would probably disappear you from the view of most of people. So what we're really talking about is legislation that's not necessary because we have voluntary efforts, which actually would like to see the government more involved in supporting, is not gonna be effective because the actual target here, which is adult sites, uh, the vast majority are not in the United States, and at the end of the day is also unconstitutional, is gonna leave us once again in a morass of years of litigation uh, and do nothing to protect kids. Well, let me, let me play devil's advocate, <clears throat> if, I, if I can, just for a second. This um, sexually explicit label would be affixed to all websites. Um, before you saw any material of that nature, you'd have to have this, this page or a, a pop-up or I don't, I'm not exactly sure how it worked, but at least before you saw something um, or were inadvertently exposed to it, you'd have to see this sign, which would alert you to that there's sexually explicit material behind. Is this so different from the Can Spam Act, which I believe was kind of, it was modeled after, the Can Spam Act was also uh, sponsored by Senator Burns, Conrad Burns in, in, in the Senate Commerce Committee. Now, that piece of legislation says if you send an email to somebody, an unsolicited email, and it has material of a sexually explicit nature, it has to contain in the subject line of that email a tag that says it's sexually explicit. Now, again, the Federal Trade Commission, just like this proposal, has to deal with that. Now, I, I, that seems to be uh, upheld constitutionally. I don't think it's never been challenged. Like what, is your group? Why isn't your group challenged it? Well, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it applies to content that somebody is affirmatively pushing in front of a viewer, not not material that people have to go out search <clears throat> and find. Uh, and and it is not a criminal statute, and I think that that is critical here. Uh, it is you know it is it is a statute aimed at what. Uh, to make, help people make choices when they get something in their inbox. But having said that, we, can we think it is constitutional. We have to, unconstitutional. We have to put our resources into things that we think are going to have the greatest impact. And you know, we view a proposal to literally to require any site, and yes, it's called any site that is commercial in nature, but we now have hundreds of thousands of individual citizens who now support their sites, I see Google is here, with Google ads or the same on other, uh, which, are, which are now commercial sites. So just conceptually, this doesn't fit with the internet as we know it. Should the portals in fact be encouraging 
uh, people who are putting up content on their sites to either use meta tags, uh, label, or rate? Yes, and, and there are many things that we ought to be doing and pushing to well, another level. Let me, let me go to Stephen. Stephen. Let me just say a, a little bit more about what I meant by the unintended consequences of this well-intentioned bill. First of all, it does absolutely nothing for material coming from overseas. And overseas, by the way, includes Canada and Mexico. Uh, in other words, this is just a local ordinance uh, for a medium that is global and is uh, not only has it, is it a converging uh, medium, we, we're now talking about a post-convergence world where television and movies and video, all kinds of uh, digital uh, entertainment is available through this medium. So. And in, in terms of another unintended consequence, would sexually explicit material on the net also include some of the more adult type material that we see on HBO, which will also be available? Will it, will it uh, apply to movies that perhaps get an R rating? So will all of that also have to be labeled? And if they're not labeled with the criminal issue that uh, we've just heard, uh, will that apply? Final point I just want to make is we do work very closely with the adult industry. Uh, folks like Vivid and Penthouse and Playboy, they've all labeled, uh, supported our work for many years. They have privately, now, now not so privately, mentioned to me that um, it would be very simple for them to simply move their servers to Canada or to Mexico and deliver the same material without having to have this label on their site. So. Um, we see a lot of real serious problems with this uh, initiative. Well, let me give us equal time to, to Larry on that devil's advocate question. Um, well, let me make a, a few responses to, to what the previous one uh, speakers have said. First of all, you said that, uh, that it doesn't apply to people overseas. Does your voluntary uh, rating system apply to pornographers overseas? Our system was set up in 2000 as a global system. so. Content providers from all over the world use it, yes. They do. And it's translated into the major languages. Uh, we have considerable take up uh, in Europe. In fact, we heard at a uh, round table we had in New York only two days ago how much the French and the German sites in particular use the system. So if they're willing to do that voluntarily, why wouldn't they do that in compliance with the law? Uh, there's a big difference between, uh, well, first of all, the French and the Germans wouldn't bother. It's a U.S. law. Um, why, why would they? Then they've already gone through the procedure of using our own system and promoting it and educating their users. Why would they then adopt yet another system? It would be a bit like the Motion Pictures Association suddenly having to put a, yet another label on every movie that came out because the government decided they had to. Jeff, can, can I, can I can add, add on to that? Um, well, I, wasn't, I wasn't finished with my yeah, comments. No, but okay, cool. okay. All right. um, actually, I think that in a, in a way, if you're talking about that there, everybody is willing to do this voluntary system, and one of the reasons that people do voluntary systems is that because they want to show that they're being good corporate citizens, <clears throat> I find it hard to believe that people who are engaging voluntarily in doing something would then show themselves to be bad corporate citizens by not complying with the law, whether they're domestic or overseas. But in any event, the overall uh, point about overseas is that, you know, this is one step. Yeah, you're right. We can't control everything but we still think it's important to make one step going that way. Um, so that's, you know, in the issue of the overseas. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of things that we can't control overseas, and it's true, the internet is a global system. Um, but we don't think that that's a reason not to try to do something about what's going on in this country right now. And particularly, uh, which you said they said privately, which in this forum, since it's no longer private, <laughs> um, you know, if those companies are simply going to shift their operations to Canada or Mexico, once again, that shows that they are not, in fact, being good corporate citizens, um, which kind of undermines your point about, about why voluntary is so, is so helpful um, and undermines the good faith that, that people who participate in the voluntary system uh, claim to be showing. Of course, we're willing and, and going on to the nature of voluntary. We would love to have something that's voluntary, but apparently it's not working. I mean, I know that you put a lot of effort into it, but the internet is a wash in pornography, and it's a wash in pornography that people cannot protect themselves from. Getting on to the point about protecting themselves from, Leslie said, well, look, can spam is something that's being forced on people, but the internet is <coughs> pervasive, and this is very similar to uh, the case uh, in Pacifica where, where uh, you know, the seven dirty words 
which was viewed as a uh, broadcast was viewed as a pervasive uh, system. And the fact is that we are not trying to prevent anybody from going out and speaking. We're trying to prevent the unwilling listener from being assaulted in their home by all this stuff. And we talked about the nature of the internet and technology and we can't stifle innovation. We don't think we're stifling innovation. What we're doing is we're protecting people in a very limited way, the best we can, without interfering in anybody's free speech. And we're protecting individuals from this ever-changing and pervasive technology. All right, that's a really interesting First Amendment comment on yeah. pervasiveness. Um, in Pacifica, uh, pervasiveness meant that broadcasters could broadcast their signal right through walls and into people's homes. No matter what you did, you couldn't stop that, that signal at your front door, um, at the wall of your living room. It, it literally came in and was received by bunny ear antennas or the antenna on your roof. Um, is that the same as pervasive? Are we getting to the point where the legal justification for the government um, to do this Pervasiveness for the internet is the same as per pervasiveness. In well, I'm not. I'm not I, taking I, a legal position. Oh, okay, no. okay. I'm not taking. But a it's legal an interesting position. question. Well. But I think. But I think in the in the context of this debate that we're having here, I would just like to throw that out there and point that out. And also, you know, I'll just I'll just um, quote from another famous case, which Leslie's probably aware of, Frisbee v. Schultz. Um, there simply is the Supreme Court. There simply is no right to force speech into the home of an un unwilling listener. A person's a captive in their home. And, you know, you could say, well, you can turn off the Internet. Well, you know, you don't have to go out there and surf the Internet. But as long as we're talking about the effect of technology in people's lives and how important technology is, you can't seriously say to someone, don't use the Internet. Well, and actually, we would never say that. We're I, actually I think, big fans we, I, of I, think I would be very unlikely to say that. The, the Internet is not a pervasive medium, at least as, as courts have um, defined that term. It is a user-generated and user-driven medium, meaning that, the, that not only do users select what they want to see, but they have tools to control that. Are those tools perfect? Not at all. Uh, but we have been, you know, ar we have argued in the courts you know, with this Justice Department, with prior Justice Departments, as to whether or not standards of law that grow out of that pervasive definition ought to apply. And if they were, we would be in the same situation we are with broadcast television, uh, where we're not able to see Private Ryan in some places because of an indecency standard. So I think we need to take that off the table. I think that just takes us down uh, a, a path that's both dangerous, wrong, and worse than what we're discussing here. So I, you know, but, well, I would, again, I, I was, I was, <laughs> I, I was not making a legal argument. I'm just trying to, you know, again. Uh, uh, just discuss the discuss the subject matter. Generally. I apologize. I right. misunderstood. But let me let, let me talk. Let's, let me. Stephen yeah. had a comment. I just want to shift the conversation a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about filtering because we've been talking about labeling a great deal, and and a very very simple label tag which uh, is being proposed here. And I'm always in favor of simplicity over complexity. The problem is is the net is a very complex medium. It is not simple. There aren't. Uh, seven or eight like movie producers that you can corral into a room. They're not just several network operators and so on. So uh, take the most uh, probably widely used filtering tool uh, that's out there that many of you may not even have heard of, RuleSpace, which is used by Microsoft, used by Yahoo, was used by AOL for some time. And they, their routines, the very first thing they do is look for labels. They look for the ICRA label. Why? Because we have 46 different descriptors within the system. It is very detailed, very deep in, in the way in which it describes content, not just an on-off type of a label. And it looks and uses artificial intelligence, URL block lists, word recognition, all sorts of other new ways of analyzing. So um, simply having a label that says this is to be switched off takes us away from the innovations, as you were talking about earlier, uh, where the technology is leading. Could more be done? Absolutely. This is where I feel that um, the three legs of the stool comes in. We are, by the way, not anti-government. We believe that there is an absolutely critical role for government oversight and support for this sort of a measure. But the central tenet is robust industry self-regulation. And thirdly, and we probably haven't really talked about that yet, is parental education, parental empowerment. 
This is a generation, I put my hand up here too, a generation who is still baffled by this thing called the internet, whereas our children are leading the way. And my 10-year-old knows far better how to use uh, the equipment that we have at home than I do. Well, Stephen, let me, let me just play devil's advocate again. Um, <clears throat> let's try it being a fair and balanced moderator. It, it, in the COPA Commission, uh, which you served on, there was a Blue Ribbon panel, and you were one of the Blue Ribbon panelists on the COPA Commission. Uh, they said that the key to labeling is, is broad adoption of the label. Wouldn't this, this provision, as uh, drafted by the Department of Justice and, and now in, in Senate legislation, wouldn't that spur tremendously adoption of a label? And, and, and also, as it moves, it, it, as it gets implemented by the Federal Trade Commission, which implemented um, the Can Spam Act's um, adult uh, sexually explicit material provision, couldn't they say that um, someone implementing the ICRA uh, system uh, would be in a safe harbor and that would be, wouldn't that ultimately spur um, adoption of a label? Well, you're talking about two very different things. A government-mandated label created and operated and criminalized, if you will, by the FTC is quite a different suggestion to having ICRA and other systems being used as a safe harbor. What's happened in Germany is a very interesting example. The Youth Protection Act there created a body, the KJM, that said to industry, look, come up with solutions. And uh, if we think they're robust enough, we will bless them in a safe harbor kind of a way. They didn't legislate, they didn't choose which technology right up front in the law would be done. So, and by the way, we've seen adoption rates in Germany jump from 10 to 90 percent uh, in anticipation of this. So, again, well-intentioned, and, and the more the government's involved in this, I think the better, as long as they don't legislate a particular type of technology uh, approach. Can I, can I follow up on that? I mean, I think it's the, the lesson of the V chip. I think is the mo is is illustrative here. The government came in and said you must do a V chip. It's now more than ten years later, and we've had zero innovation in that space in ten years. Had the government come in and done a sexually explicit label before there was an ICRA standard, I don't believe we would have an ICRA standard today, and I don't believe we would have that more robust label. Uh, when you have a label that is, that is so overbroad, and I, I contend that the, when you have a label that applies to hardcore pornography, Victoria's Secret, HBO, um, you know, one episode of The Sopranos, and uh, an outsider artist who has a website, and all of them put the same label on under a government mandate, you don't have a label that empowers parents. You simply have a label that will disappear vast swaths of the internet from a lot of people's viewing. And that is not, you know, if we, we have to do things that are granular. We have to, we're in, a, we're in a converged media environment where we are moving well understood ratings. I'll move from labeling to rating systems. You don't help people make decisions uh, when some PG-13 content will also have a government mandated sexually explicit. All you do is confuse people. Put aside the constitutional questions. Well, I, 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 I want to respond to that because I'm not sure what you're talking about in terms of the Sopranos. I, I don't think I've ever actually seen it. I'm sorry. But um, in any event, I, I, was, I, wasn't aware, or, well, I, I wasn't aware that those have actual sexually explicit conduct on them that would be equivalent to hardcore pornography. I mean, everybody is welcome They're to look at... They're not equivalent to hardcore pornography. Yeah, but... The definition, I mean, if you look at the definition of uh, sexually explicit conduct, which is contained in um, uh, 18 U.S.C. 22562A, uh, and the five things that are under there, uh, I find it hard to believe that that is on uh, uh, regular cable. And if it is, in any event, they're required to comply with a lot of other regulations regarding exploitation of children. Um, and so if, a, if an artist is putting out photographs of people having sex, and calls himself an artist, I mean, maybe they're very, you know, artistic photographs, I suppose, uh, on his website, he has to maintain, under regulations that we published last year and which have been upheld virtually entirely uh, uh, in litigation over the course of the last year, he has to have records proving the ages of those, that those people... Uh, I, I understand that. So and your definition doesn't require that people have sex. It's lewd and uh, lascivious exhibition. Uh, well, it's, it says... Uh, it's been interpreted because it comes from a 
child porn statute, a child porn statute that the definition ought to be broad. We're talking about child pornography. You're now taking that statute, which has been interpreted to include in certain situations wearing bathing suits and leotards, and you are up, you're just pulling it out and applying it to all content okay, well, on the again, Internet. Well, again, I, I encourage people, if, if people want to read that, and if they also want to read the cases that have interpreted it, they're welcome to. In fact, conveniently, since I know this is <laughs> going to be an issue, um, I will quote to you, uh, if I can find it in here, uh, in any event, the standards. And yes, it is true that the phrase lascivious exhibition of the genitals uh, or pubic area of a person uh, that standard does come from a case, however, involving child porn. However, that involves things that sh I think any reasonable person would understand that if there were, I mean, to be honest about it, uh, you know, graphic naked pictures of people, uh, they'll understand what they're going to mean. Those sorts of things are, you know, the focal point of the, visible, of the visible depiction is on the genitalia or pubic area. Uh, intended or designed to elicit a sexual response in the viewer. I mean, those are not dependent upon whether the person is a child. It's true, a couple of the standards in this case do depend on, you know, whether it's a, an unnatural pose for a child. But these sorts of standards, I mean, you know, lascivious exhibition of the genitals of the person basically means, and everybody knows that it means, a naked shot of a person, all right, with focusing on their genitals, right? It doesn't mean topless, it doesn't mean uh, cheerleaders or anything like that. In the case that you're referring to, uh, because I've, I've dealt with uh, a number of opponents of, of the Section 225 regulations on this, which interpreted that this standard to mean that it could include someone who was wearing clothing was involving a case of minors, prepubescent girls, who were filmed doing striptease dances to music by a man who was focusing on their genitalia. And, That's the and, case. And it was, it's appropriate as interpreted for children. But yeah, but you can't, you, standard... you, you can't extend that and say, as people have said to me, well, that means that, uh, you know, the scene in Anchorman where Christina Applegate agrees to go out with Will Farrell is covered by lascivious exhibition of the genitals. I mean, it's not, and it's ridiculous for anyone to think that it is. I mean, I just, I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it, and I don't think anybody who looks at photographs that everybody knows are lascivious exhibition of the genitals, which would include, for example, you know, Playboy, uh, if it's focusing on the genitalia, you know, that's different from Sex and the City. I mean, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that is on Sex and the City. Is it different than art photos? Is it different? This is, this is a bill that actually is not about visual depictions. I thought it was very interesting that in your drafting of this, it doesn't say visual depictions. It says... It says material. So as I read this, it also it is also descriptions. Uh, you know, the, the, well, the this, law says uh, visual depictions, and that you chose to write and send to Congress a law that says material. Well, it's well it was intended. It was. I will tell you that it was intended to cover visual depictions. Well, it's now in That's seven places about. in the Senate. Let me let me ask one more question before I go to the audience for questions. questions. But one thing that this this line of discussion. Um, brings out is, as this bill, let's try to imagine this bill goes forward and gets enacted into law, gets signed by the president. <clears throat> I guess the question is, as a web operator um, or someone in the private sector, whether I'm just an average person putting up a website or I'm a, a commercial venture website, how do, how do I know? I mean, we've had an interesting back and forth on what the standard means. How, how can we be sure what the standard really means? Would the Federal Trade Commission um, define that? Would they give guidance in cases? How, how does somebody have assurance? And again, I, I, you did mention that there's criminal penalties here. How, with criminal, criminal penalties on the line, how can you be really sure? How, how, how do you, how do you, oh, and is there any chilling effect by, is there any way we can make it even more clear? Well, I mean, for one thing, um, as I said, this, there are five categories of conduct covered, and this is one of those categories. So. You know, the other four categories are pretty straightforward, frankly. Um, so lascivious exhibition of the generals, and I don't want this whole discussion to be about that, but it, it, it unless you guys do. I don't blame you. But, um, Please. <laughs> lunchtime is yes. lunchtime. Right. Um, like my sandwich. But, it, but uh, I think that it, it, it has become that because a lot of the parade of horribles that opponents of this are going to try to come up with will cover those sorts of things. Um, and that's where you, that's where you could, you could, I mean, 
I suppose, I suppose the opponents of this would say non-frivolous arguments, although I think they're somewhat frivolous, that all these good things would be, would be chilled by that. Um, so, so in a sense, it, it unfortunately has to focus on that. Um, but, you know, then there's going to be a balance. You're going to have to balance, you know, is, is the risk of that stuff being chilled, legitimate things being chilled under the guise of, well, I don't know whether this is the lascivious exhibition of the genitals or not, um, versus the other four categories of stuff that we do want to prevent people from watching. And, you know, one thing to consider is that if you were to say that because too much material that would constitute protected speech, even though it might be chilled because we're afraid that it's a lascivious exhibition of the genitals, does that outweigh all of the, um, you know, sexually explicit naked photographs of people focusing on their genitals, even if they're not having sex, which well, is... yeah, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the Constitution, but yes, constitutionally, we both know that it would, that it would be overbroad and it would be vague, and we, we believe it is. This would be worth struggling through that question if we didn't already have this going on, if we didn't already have an ICRA, if we didn't already have labeling. I mean, if we could all collaborate around encouraging more people to use the tools we have, we'd make some progress forward. If, if we, you know, simply spend the next five years again litigating another one of these cases, I don't see how any child is helped. And that will be the result if this is passed. Well, as promised, I did want to open it up to questions for the remain, uh, at least uh, intermittently throughout the remainder of the program. Um, any, any questions I have, and by the way, I'm, um, I apologize, I should have gave notice that we'd probably talk about <laughs> uh, things of a sexual Much nature time. during the panel. If anyone's offended, I apologize. Um, I should I'm, have I'm so that. offended, I'm going to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I should have made that clear. I thought it was in the invitation. But. That's, why, that's why I waited. Uh, in the back there, please. Instead of me. <laughs> I'm just going to repeat that for the camera so people watching online um, can hear. How, it, you had talked about if it, it doesn't need to be criminal, it could be uh, 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 voluntary, and that the government could play a role in assisting and encouraging um, voluntary implementation of, of labeling, let's say. Um, how would that look? Uh, let me start with an example from the uh, previous administration. Uh, the, one of the previous administration I'm referring to is the Clinton-Gore administration. They held not one but three White House summits on this issue uh, between 1997 and 2000. And they used it, um, interestingly enough, as kind of a bully pulpit to say to industry, come on, you need to step up to the plate here. And the industry would come and say, well, Mr. President, this is what we're doing, um, but more meat needs to be done. And perhaps the biggest area of cooperation we could do was in the public education side, the, the messaging side. Uh, this is something that we have uh, attempted on a number of occasions with this administration. I've been to the White House to talk about the idea of the president convening a, a roundtable with the top executives, with so many of the uh, family organizations from across the spectrum. Uh, we are nonpartisan, and we're, uh, you know, we work with all, all hues of this particular debate. Um, they, this administration has had uh, a lot on its mind since September 11th, and. Quite frankly, uh, some of the folks, some of my friends even from folks on the, on the right of this issue are quite disappointed as well that this is, administration has not done so. I gave examples earlier of how the Germans did it in Britain uh, when they uh, created Ofcom, the new Uber regulatory body. They looked at the idea of regulating content and said, no, what the government and what Ofcom should be able to do is to bring all of the different types of industry together in the room and say to them, look, we've got to come up with comprehensive and cohesive sets of, policy, of policies and technologies and then messages uh, to, to parents. This is what we're looking for from the U.S. government. And I, and I would say that when somebody does the right thing, I mean, the adult industry in July announced, you know, a serious best practice to make sure everybody is rated. I would say the response ought to be to congratulate them and urge them to move forward, not to introduce a law that suddenly criminalizes what they've just um, agreed to do. 
voluntarily. We need a lot more parental education. We're in a converged media environment, and I think industry does have some complicated things that they need to deal with. They need to deal with the, uh, the content that's being generated by users. Um, the government could uh, provide funds for a lot more education. Uh, you know, there was a time that there was some money going into schools uh, around technology literacy. That's pretty much disappearing. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're going sort of straight to criminal law at a time that the tools are becoming more robust. Uh, certainly, they could be doing education around getting parents to use the tools, uh, which, you know, it doesn't matter what we label or what we rate, uh, if we haven't educated parents to use the tools that are available to, uh, to make value out of that, then... Well, let, let, me, let me give Larry, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. no, well, I mean, no. the, go the government is doing a lot. Um, I mean, particularly, we, we work very closely with NICMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which has a lot of uh, stuff. Uh, Produces, um, you know, seminars. Um, their um, the names. Uh, they have specific websites which teach parents and kids about online safety and so forth. So the government actually is doing a lot. Um, we just think that more can be done, and we think this is the we think this is the way to do it. And uh, you know, it's very nice when people adopt things voluntarily, but sometimes it helps to have the government pushing you in that direction. And uh, if they don't step up to it, then we're going to have to legislate it. Yeah. You are doing a lot with NICMIC, and that is around a very serious question of safety and predation. And we tend to put those issues together with um, viewing unwanted content. And I really want to try to separate that because those are because we tend to use those issues as sort of a tail wagging the dog of this very different question, which is simply, you know, should a child get access to, you know, the equivalent of Playboy online? This issue needs to be dealt with, with with policies and decisions that are different than what we make decisions oh, about I, child predation. I, they're yeah, not, no, they're I not agree. the same thing. Yeah, no, they're, they're not the same thing, and we're doing lots of things uh, against predation. Um, but this is also one of those areas that we want to work on. And other questions? Ma'am? Um, let me just repeat it for the camera. Uh, the question was, did the FT Federal Trade Commission have the opportunity to review the legislation before it was proposed? Um, and based on the sign-in sheet, I think there are some folks from the Federal Trade Commission here today. <laughs> um, you know, I wasn't involved in the, in the clearance process for that, um, so I can't answer that uh, exactly, but I can certainly get back to you on it. I mean, one, one thing that I should point out, which, because it was raised earlier, um, yeah, this is going to be uh, a regulatory process with the FTC. So it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take due account of all the technological issues and all the definitional issues that have come up. And it'll go through notice and comment and, uh, and so forth. So uh, we've got, you know, uh, fairly good confidence that we'll be able to come up with something that will withstand uh, any legal challenge. And um, as I said earlier, the CAN SPAM Act worked very similarly. I don't know whether the Federal Trade Commission had a previous opportunity to review and, and comment on that, but ultimately they did implement the, the rulemaking. And other questions? Yes. Uh, we're still examining that issue. We have not uh, uh, come to any definite conclusions yet about what to, how to go forward with that. Um, but yes, the, the Attorney General uh, announced that he was examining this in a speech. Uh, it was publicly announced that he met with uh, CEOs of ISPs to get their input, and we're still examining the issue. Uh, in, in regard to that, we will have, as the third in this series will be on October 5th, at 2 o'clock in the Mike Mansfield room, and it'll be on this issue specifically on data retention. So that's the, the last last one in the three-part series. Leslie? Just the mention of ISPs made me think about another unintended consequence, or at least one that I haven't been able to completely unpack. I mean, uh, this new law is not supposed to impose liability on sites that don't review 
the content. They just simply provide the space for the content. Um, there are a number of sites like MySpace who try to act as good citizens and review images. So it seems to me that the legislation almost discourages operators from taking even sort of initial steps to review content because once they do, they become also become subject to criminal law. That's how I read it. I may be wrong, but I think it's one of those situations where understanding, you know, a little bit better understanding of how the internet works, uh, I think leads you to understand why we ought to be doing this on a voluntary basis. With the government, as far as I'm concerned, kicking, screaming, and pushing as much as you can. Other questions? Mark? I'm trying to. <laughs> And just repeat, sorry, this is awkward. Repeating for the micro, uh, the camera, uh, the question is that obscenity is actually illegal, illegal content under the law. Um, this particular standard would be content that is not obscenity, but short of that. Yeah, I mean, obscenity, uh, you know, there's the Miller standard and has a definition, and it's illegal. I mean, anybody who puts obscenity up on the internet, we prosecute. <laughs> and just in the last uh, year, we've had a couple of really major uh, prosecutions for that. So this is beyond that, yes, because this is intended to cover material that is legal without censoring it, but simply providing a warning to people. Okay. Any other questions? Can I just, on this, um, we, have, we also have to be careful about making a distinction between material that is harmful to minors and material that is offensive. I think often we conflate the two. So the Janet Jackson uh, event of a couple of years ago, which, by the way, has fueled a lot of this kind of debate in the discussion and certainly a lot of the activity from the FCC on indecency, came about because many, many people were offended by that display. Um, whether any children were harmed is an interesting question. And I think that, uh, uh, I'd, I mean, my background is in psychology. We do not yet have enough research to know what impact this has uh, on children or, or even on young adults who obviously would be swept into this uh, under the age of 18, presumably, um, whether it actually causes actual harm or whether we're just talking about general offense that, uh, that people feel. Well, let me ask you, since you raised the harmful, harmful standard, let me play devil's advocate again. Would you, you or Leslie feel more comfortable with this standard were it to be, um, uh, rather than sexually explicit, which you feel goes pretty deep into offensive material, uh, would you be more comfortable if it was a harmful to minor standard? You know, I, I wouldn't for the following reason. Trying to apply a national harmful to minor standard on the internet uh, when a lot of, uh, you know, harmful to minor standard is just obscenity as to children. That's sort of the short way to present it. Uh, I think it is extremely difficult, given regional differences, for us to come up with uh, an understood standard uh, of what the community standard is to apply to. But, but you know, the Supreme Court said that it's constitutional I, to do so. I understand. The, uh, which is, understand. What is constitutional to do so? To have a to have a national standard. Well, to have it to have the standard harmful to minors dependent upon applied to the internet, even though it depends upon community standards. I think that I, I think that to then put a labeling requirement based on that, I, I think is going to be a very difficult thing, and I think it's only going to add to the confusion because I, you know, there there is no doubt in my mind that what is harmful to minors in um, Idaho is not what's viewed as harmful to minors in New York City, and you know, uh, yes, it could be a better understood standard that's sexually explicit for sure. Let me let me ask you a question uh, if I can ask be devil's advocate here. Sure. <laughs> um, funny, I thought I was the devil on the uh, panel. That was going to be <laughs> my line. Any, no, no. Um, just the advocate. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Just the advocate, yeah. Uh, um, would you feel, Leslie, would you uh, feel more comfortable with this standard if it did not include all five categories of sexually explicit conduct? You know, I don't know. I'd have to look at it. But, but the problem is I don't see 
You know, I think when the government gets involved, when we criminalize the concept of labeling, uh, you know, that we're down a slippery slope and that there's no way to avoid vagueness, there's no way to avoid overbreath, and more importantly, there's no way to avoid chilling. And I think that, you know, that, I think that's my bottom line. We can sit down in a room, we can play with a standard, we could probably get to one that I would say, oh, I think, you know, more people will not think it applies to them. But at the end of the day, um, I think you have to agree, criminal law is the biggest club we carry around. Uh, and you, you guys haven't gotten it right yet. We're now in the eighth year of litigation on COPA, and a lot of other things could be achieved in that eight years collaboratively um, that that litigation uh, certainly has not. Uh, I have a question in the back, sir. Um, I don't have any data on that in particular. I mean, there are studies, and I, I don't know if I have the information with me, but there are studies that have been done, I mean, just you know, within the last couple of years, about the percentage of children who uh, come across pornography unwanted, or claiming that they came across it unwanted. Um, but, um, and those are, you know, high enough that we think it's a problem. Now, you know, it's entirely possible that, uh, that we're wrong. I mean, if Congress wants to hold hearings, I mean, this is really Congress's, you know, area of expertise is to go out and do fact-finding. So I think it would be a good idea, and if, if, if there's sufficient uh, concern uh, on the part of the opponents that say, well, you know, prove that this is a problem, Congress can hold hearings, and we'll have witnesses, and we can discuss this matter. Um, but, you which know... We, which we would endorse, since we don't... The, the notion of a criminal law just finding its way into an appropriations bill is not, in our view, the best way to... Well, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to tell Congress what to do. I'm just pointing out that it that's is, that this is, yeah, right. this is, this is, this is, this is con that's, that is Congress's expertise. Fact finding is really Congress's expertise. Um, you know, we came up with this idea because we are aware that concerns have been expressed about it, um, and we think it's important, and we proposed it. Uh, it might very well be a good idea for Congress to do some hearings and try to define exactly what the scope of the issues is. And if somebody, you know, if, if we're proved wrong, I mean, if, 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 if we're proved wrong and somebody says, you know what, the, the Internet, uh, the voluntary uh, program is working fine, that there is no uh, push of pornography into people's homes, and this is unnecessary, well, then it's unnecessary. And, and you know, we were well-intentioned but, but, but misguided. At the moment, we happen to think we're well-intentioned and rightly guided, and that's why we're moving forward with it. Let me make a comment about um, congressional fact-finding. Uh, Congress has asked um, on this whole milieu of issues, um, not covering not just the content we're dealing with today, but also some of the other child exploitation issues. Um, in, the, in my recent memory, Congress has asked twice um, of a Blue Ribbon panel uh, to look at these issues. And um, one was the uh, in the COPA legislation, they asked for a Blue Ribbon panel to look at this issue, uh, Stephen, as well as Many others served on that panel, including Bob Flores, who was at the Department of Justice uh, uh, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Protection. They came up with a report. It's a, it's, I encourage everybody to read it. It's on copacommission.org. It's a great report. It was done back in, I believe, 2000 was issued. Um, the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee actually hosts the, the website for it, so you can download the report uh, as a public service. The other one was, um, uh, it was Congress asked the National Academies of Sciences um, and appointed Dick Thornburg, uh, former Attorney General for, under the Reagan administration, to come up with a report. Um, he put together a blue ribbon panel, came up with um, a small book, uh, Youth Pornography and the Internet. It's actually a great resource as well. Um, in your sheet, there's links to both those URLs where you can download that report, and I encourage you to do so. So congressional fact-finding there, um, hearings, I guess, are always good. And if I have any more questions, we can kind of wrap up on. Adam, you get the last question.
and let me just repeat the question for the for the camera. Good. It's a, yeah. <laughs> Basically, how does this work in, in an enforcement field? We have a tremendous amount of content of this nature out there, and, and how does justice enforce this? Uh, picking a few high-profile cases and do th doing this internationally. Uh, first of all, let me. Uh, perhaps you were just using uh, imprecise terminology. We don't selectively prosecute anyone, uh, which has kind of a <laughs> more technical term than 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 I think you meant it. Um, well, we would set up an enforcement regime uh, through the uh, regulation, just as we have for the uh, 18 U.S.C. 2257 regulations. Um, I don't know at the moment how that would uh, be most efficiently designed, but that's one of the things that we would work on. Um, as with any other crime, uh, we prosecute cases that are brought to us. Uh, either we do investigations because we have uh, information about it, um, we uh, conduct it, uh, you know. I, I don't. I don't want to get into that, frankly, um, because I'm not. I'm not really sure, um, and I don't want to, you know, sort of stake out a, a position on how that would do. But that's something that we would examine when it comes down to it. I mean, it is. It is true that, yeah. I mean, when you have high-profile prosecutions, uh, that serves as a deterrent, in addition to uh, simply uh, getting the people who've been violating uh, the law. But um, I don't think this would necessarily differ uh, the way we'd approach this from any other uh, criminal statute that we enforce. Um, last word, Leslie? I would say the way that it differs is that uh, we're dealing with constitutionally protected material. And so the difference between are we discouraging other criminals or chilling other speakers is, I think, at the core of uh, the distinction. You know, my, my final question, if I may, uh, before we have to leave, uh, let me just ask the panelists, uh, you know, just a, you know, in, in 20 words or less, uh, something like if... Is that the, my 20 uh, words? Uh, Attorney General Gonzalez said, what we want to do is keep children from inadvertent exposures to, <clears throat> I think, sexually explicit material. I think we can all have an idea what that, that is. Um, what is the best way, 20 words or less, or 60 words or less, What's the best way to do that as a closing? The best way to do that is to enact our proposal, which is no different from somebody uh, or current regimes which have been upheld at the state level, um, or state, state regimes which have been upheld both in federal and state court, that when you walk into a 7-Eleven, sexually explicit material is behind a blind rack so that People walking around the store looking for other things aren't exposed to it. Uh, education, education, education. And I would add to that um, the new parental controls that are going to be in Windows Vista whenever Windows Vista arrives, um, which is something which many people don't know about. Uh, for the very first time, uh, the operating system itself will have a very, very good uh, and free, if you think of it in that way, a uh, system that you don't have to download and can use right there uh, for your children. Leslie? I would say ditto. I'd say education, innovation, and collaboration in industry are the three. Well, let me just um, say, next week on Thursday at 2 o'clock in this room, we're going to go over the, um, sh the event, which is Should Congress Decree Social Networking and Chat Sites Teen-Free Zones? Again, that's here. We have Donna Rice Hughes um, from Enough is Enough on the panel. We have Jay Chaudhry from North Carolina's Attorney General's Office, Ro from Roy Cooper's office. And we'll also have uh, Dana Boyd from the University of California, Berkeley, and Adam Thayer, um, who's in the back there from the Progress and Freedom Foundation, debating that issue. Um, I want to thank all the panelists. Larry, Stephen, Leslie, and thank all of you. Thanks for coming.